Okay, well, we've got an Inyale here. And I'm fairly certain it's going to cross out in this little clearing in front of us, which will provide us with a beautiful view. And then may, if we even lucky, continue up to Twin Dams, which we are very close to for a drink. And I'm fairly certain more will start following behind it. Oh. And it's, it's youngsters just popped out behind it, so there's at least one more, but I'm guessing possibly even more that will come through following this initial female. Such pretty antelope, probably my favorite in this area. Their markings are incredible. And also the habitat that you often find them in, they like thick riverine vegetation, so we do see them in quite often some beautiful scenery. So our luck with the squirrels continue this morning. Copy that, good idea. Well, we've just got a request through from Lynn on Twitter, and Lynn is asking if I can find the orange-breasted bushrike in my book to show you all and what a good idea Lynn and sorry for not doing that initially I told you all what a beautiful bird it was but haven't actually showed you a picture of it so that is what I will do so just to keep you updates, updated on Brent's movements he is searching for any sign of a leopard and as I did say earlier this morning he is hungry to find one and that is what he's up to he's not having much luck at the moment but he is hoping to find some good tracks of a leopard to follow up on now even though they look quite similar once VM zooms in you'll notice they are considerably different the two at the top the orange breasted bushrike which is the one we heard calling now is incredibly beautiful and the grey headed slightly larger also has a beautiful orange breast but its grey head is more prominent than that of the orange breasted and what I'm even going to do is I'm just going to page back one more page and show you some of the other shri uh, shrikes that we get the gorgeous bush shrike at the bottom which is a beauty and sadly, one we don't see this far south in the Kruger is the crimson-breasted shrike. So not a bush shrike, but also a very pretty bird. And for those of you who are interested in the birds, it, a lot depends on the specific area of the Kruger National Park that you would go to, depending on what birds you would like to see or hope to see. Okay, let's see if we can creep up a little bit closer to these in Yala. They seem relaxed with us. I level with them, we are on a slight depression. And even just looking at the monitor now, you can really notice the difference in the shot when we are on the same level as them. Beautiful. So it's just her and her youngster, which is interesting. They usually travel in slightly 
larger herds than than this or it's usually about five or six of them on average moving together now you'll already be able to tell the sex of this youngster even though you can't see any horns now this is another question i'm going to put to you how is it that i've been able to establish that this is a young male even though we cannot see any horns a little bit because the as you can see oh no there we go actually a great view so take note of its face that is where you are going to get the clue to distinguish the sex of this youngster to how she's twitching her ears from side to side and the Inyala and also the Kudu, one of their close relatives, have got these very large ears which are suited perfectly to the habitat that they find themselves in. Because they are often in thick vegetation, these big ears allow them to try and detect prey or sorry predators as their eyesight certainly wouldn't be the best option in thick vegetation so you'll notice she's listening very intently pivoting her ears from side to side sometimes one listening forward one listening back just making sure everything's safe i think the fact that it is just the two of them will also increase her alertness because she cannot rely on other eyes and ears from other herd members So, there have been two different general answers to, with regards to the sex of this youngster, and one of which was the ridge down the back. Sadly, that is not applicable, so that is not the sign we are looking for to distinguish that it's a male. It's the small white chevron between the eyes that already seems quite prominent and the males will have this white marking between the eyes and the females to a very small degree and you'll even notice on this female that when she turns around she will have a very very slight white marking between her eyes but not nearly as prominent as even her youngster let me try and creep forward a bit so vm can show you that white chevron between the eyes So, so there you can go, yeah, there you can see she's got very very slight white marking, whereas the males will have a considerably more prominent white marking. Go with them now, please. There we go. Down to Ramey and Lynn, Arquette and Judy. You all got the answers right, and I'm sure a lot more of you as well. But Nikki is battling to keep up with all the answers that are being sent through. 
So well done to all of you who did get it right. The benefits of Belignala do have is that they are browsers, so they have a large variety of different vegetation that they can feed on. And as you can see, she is certainly not feeding on one set plants in this area. It's a mixture of leaves and grasses as she goes. was a wonderful sighting of that mother in Yala and her youngster. Speaking of mothers and youngsters though, it may be worth our while to head across to the hyena den site. We're not very close to it at the moment, but certainly worth making our way across there. We haven't been there for a while and it would be great to see how everything is going with those cubs as well as their parents. exactly it was that we were last at the den site but for those of you who don't know we've been very fortunate in that there's a clan of hyena that have got a den site that we know of and we've been allowed some incredibly awesome encounters with the various members of that clan it's mainly the young little cubs there's three little cubs one from in the previous litter, so slightly older from another mother, and then two that are slightly smaller. So two different litters, but they're all around probably three to four months of age at the moment. Just leaving Twin Dams. So there is another vehicle there at the moment, but he said he'll be happy to make space for us as we get there. And because there are young cubs involved in the site, and we limit it to only one vehicle, and that will be done with various different species. The same might happen with leopard or lion cubs that are small. We don't put too many vehicles into the sighting and that way prevent the cubs from getting scared of vehicles and that way hopefully habituate them to a degree that they tolerate us viewing them. And thanks to many, many years of good guiding protocol in the Sabi Sands, there are incredibly well habituated animals that allow us insights into their lives and allow us to follow them without interfering on their ongoings.
conservative. Go ahead. Copy. Thank you very much. Sorry, Nikki, it's just the game drive channel again, Matt. Question for you from Ramey on Twitter, and Ramey is interested to know how many hyena clans we have here on Juma. And it's an answer that we are not entirely sure of. There are certain areas where there are few roads and it's very thick, so there could be a lot going on within that area that we simply don't know about. Um, I'm guessing there could be more than one den site on this property now, but maybe one maximum, I would say, two more den sites on our property. So it's just the one that we know of, though. Uh, that's certainly not to say that other hyena from other clans don't overlap onto this property. Well, it's like, I think... Well done, Bill the Beast. Are you good there? Have you got it? Yeah. Look at this, well spotted VM, and this is awesome, incredibly well camouflaged snakes the puff adders, and this is only the second one we've been able to show you, and I wonder where that brown snake eagle is now, that would be a showdown, this is a highly venomous snake, and I'm hoping it's going to continue slithering along and then we can try and get another visual. But I fear that it may seek refuge in all this leaf litter. You would have noticed that it's got incredibly beautiful patterns on its body, but those patterns help it blend in very well and especially in leaf litter like this. Creep forward. <laughs> well, I'm so glad that I didn't run that over. It sounded like a close call. And they can look just like branches on the road. Like I say, we are going to just wait patiently. There is a chance it may continue slithering about. But I am concerned that after this close encounter with us, it may be wanting to hide out in all this leaf litter. I may do, and it's not going to interfere too much with its business today, is possibly just lift up the branch of leaves that it's seeking refuge under, and it will just be able to slither up to the next. Oh, no, I can see it there, it's moving, it's beyond it already. Got it there? Yeah. Hey? Yeah, I got it. Hold on. 
awesome. So thankfully, I've not had to do anything. And look at this. Absolutely awesome. You'll notice it's sticking its tongue out consistently and it's looking for prey or looking for anything and its tongue is one of its most useful sensory organs because obviously being that low to the ground there's very little it can see but it can smell incredibly well and that forked tongue when it goes back into its mouth each fork would be placed into essentially their own little receiver so there's a receiver for the left fork and a receiver for the right fork and as it places those t those forks into each receiver depending on where, where the scent is coming from let's say if it's coming from the left the left hand fork would obviously pick up a stronger signal or stronger scent from there and that would lead the snake in a direction that moves it slightly to where it needs to be. I'm just going to reposition the vehicle slightly. This is an incredible opportunity. How are we looking at the Oh my god. See? How incredible is this camouflage and you'd notice that when this VM was zoomed out it would be impossible to see it. I cannot believe how fortunate we've got. Just got a question through from Anne asking whether the brown snake eagle could eat him or whether he's too big and no I think the brown snake eagle would certainly be able to eat him he's just about the perfect size for that eagle look at how beautiful those markings are now a little bit more about the venom of this snake it's highly cytotoxic which means if it were to bite you your flesh would basically rot and break down and people who are bitten by them often have to have serious surgery done if not have ampu amputations so extremely nasty venom you do not want to get bitten by this snake the reason why it's called a puff adder is because if you do get close to them just before you would maybe stand on it it would alarm you or alert you by hissing so they fill their body up with air and then let out a loud <laughs> so by puffing their body up to alert you that is how they've got their name and i can't believe how close it's coming to us it's completely relaxed with us and allowing for by far the best snake sh sighting that i've been able to share with you You can see how well that cryptic coat will help it to blend in, especially at this time of the year with all of the brown leaves. Now you'll realize how close it's coming to us by the fact that I've had to reverse the vehicle. Remain on Twitter is interested to know whether this is a youngster, and I wouldn't say that it is. It's quite large for a puff adder, especially in this area. And our sizes of these snakes do vary greatly depending on the area that you are seeing them. In other parts of Africa, they get considerably larger than the ones that I've seen in the Sabi Sands. So I think this is an adult, and I haven't seen them much bigger in this area. Also notice as it's moving, it's 
not really slithering in a serpentine motion like most snakes would. It moves in a caterpillar-like motion where it uses its ribs to pull itself forward. So caterpillar-like or rectilinear is another term that is used to describe their method of moving. And it can be useful when seeing tracks of snakes crossing the road, even just watching it now, it would leave one solid straight track across the road. And that's typical of adders and also pythons. Whereas other snakes, you would see a more typical slithering left to right motion in their track or even when they are moving. So often when we do see their tracks crossing the road, we can establish that it is a puff adder or a python and distinguish between other snakes. Imagine if we saw it catch something. That would be the ultimate show. But there doesn't seem to be too much prey around here. I'm just loving the fact that we are being able to watch it and was concerned that it was going to hide out under that leaf litter when we initially found it. You mind just zooming out a little bit just to give them an idea of how difficult it is to spot it in amongst that leaf litter. Perfect. I mean, driving along, how would you ever begin to start thinking that there's a snake right there? And I mean, it's fairly open. It's not that it's thick. But <laughs> it requires a serious zoom and the knowledge, prior knowledge that it's already there to be able to find it. Now in terms of prey that we'll be looking for, mainly rodents, but they will certainly be open-minded, as a lot of predators are in terms of what they feed on. And you may find that frogs and lizards and even small birds will also make up a large part of the snake's diet. In terms of length, the snake is probably around 20 inches in length, maybe a little bit longer, maybe about 24 inches, I would say. Maybe about two feet in length, maybe just a little bit longer, would be my estimates. In terms of thickness, the thickest part of its body would probably be that of a golf ball, I would say. But in certain areas, they'll get two or three times the size of this. But in my history in the Sabi Sands, we haven't really got the biggest puff adders in this area. And it is interesting how the same species of animal will vary greatly depending on where you find it in Africa.
I wonder if we should link around and keep an eye on it. We get to see snakes so seldomly that what I'm going to do is just drive up and see if we can maintain a visual of it. to be a little bit patient but it is going to pop out just got a question through from Lois in Buffalo. Morning, Lois. And Lois is interested to know how often the snake would have to feed. Tricky question to answer, Lois, because like most predators, it would depend on their fortune. Now, if it manages to make a big kill, snakes can go for weeks, if not months, on just one big meal. So if it manages to catch a, a big prey item, it could, like I say, be sorted for a few weeks, even months possibly, especially now that we are heading towards our winter where they'll become a lot less active and therefore not require nearly as much energy. So you probably find they do the majority of their hunting in the summer and very little in the winter. And this makes sense because the summer will be a lot warmer, which suits a cold-blooded animal. They need warmth from the sun to be, to be able to move effectively. And therefore, this guy is probably looking for one of its last meals before it does get too cold. to all of a sudden picked up its pace and I wonder what it can smell in and amongst the trunk of this tree. There could well be a cavity in there that's housing some kind of a little rodent. There seem to be a few small holes at the base of that tree. So maybe there's something tasty for it to eat in there. I'll try and reposition the vehicle one last time. Oh, not doing a great job here. Well, what a sighting that was. And let me just check around on the other side. Let's see if we can't see it coming out, just to make sure. Spotting the leopard. So, uh, the leopard, the puff adder. It's often leopard that he spots, but this morning it was a puff adder. So, I uh, hope you thoroughly enjoyed that. Our last sighting of a puff adder, which was the first one that I've managed to show you, was at night, and a very brief glimpse of it slithering across the road, whereas this morning we've really got to spend some quality time with this individual and very very fortunate that that has happened but yeah let's cut back to brent and see what he's been up to for the last while and we'll catch up with you a little bit later welcome back guys um, Romeo and I have been following up on some male leopard tracks. Um, we followed them from around uh, uh, the Balanites tree uh, in Balanites Road and they crossed um, into Arethusa. So we're now in Arethusa trying to see if we can find where the tracks went. Looks like he's gone into a drainage line um, that's to my, to my east behind me. So we're going to keep checking this area, make sure he hasn't come out. 
If not, we'll go back to last tracks and then have have a look on foot. But um, it started cloudy when we got up this morning and then it, it cleared. And now it's become cloudy again. You panicking? Us. Yes. Crested panic. Uh, Franklin having a mild panic as we drove past. I suppose it pays to be panicking when everything tries to eat you. There's no tracks coming out, so we're going to shoot round to the last place I had tracks. This is quite a big block, unfortunately, um, and quite thick. There's a big drainage system in the middle. So we've done a big loop. So quite confident the leopard hasn't come out of this area yet. Just have to go back and see. Oh, no, you made a run for it. Look, maybe if we go back a little bit. Can you see them all around us? There we go. On the right, yeah. It's dead long. Let's go and get one to pop its head out. Not being very cooperative this this morning. We were literally surrounded by a, a business of dwarf mongoose. Not playing along. There we go. Okay, you see the directly behind the log is the one just popped his oh, head up. Yeah. Here we go. Getting a little bit more curious. It's probably a good, I think, probably 10, 15 individuals around us. The smallest mammalian carnivore in Africa. really relaxed ones. Um, I don't think this is a very well used road so they're, they're probably not as used to the vehicles as, as, as other ones. Incredibly cute little guys. Let's see if we can see one who's a little bit closer to us, a little bit more in the open. Let's check this big termite round in front of us. See if we can get one a little bit closer. These guys are probably not so used to vehicles, so we're not going to stress them out too much. Maybe we'll find some more.
there's some water around there as well. So it's possible that we might have jumped ahead of him and he's now gone for a drink. those male leopard trucks um, from Gowrie Repeater across Gowrie Main on to, towards Red Dam in Arethusa. Nearly at that water, so we'll do is we'll have a quick look at the the shrews and also listen to see if we hear any alarm calls. And then, if nothing comes of that, I'm going to have a little stroll around the dam, see if you might have drunk a bit earlier before we came through. The last tracks we had were just above this little drainage line. Oh, above this little dam in the drainage line. So we're just going to stop and listen for a few, few, few minutes. And I'm going to get to your shrews, Donna. So Donna, just quickly have a look here. What I, I Donna, what I was explaining earlier that the the um, dwarf mongoose is the smallest mammalian carnivore or carnivora. So it falls under the order of carnivora. So that's you've got hyenas, um, cats, foxes, wild dogs, jackals, otters, honey badgers, polecats, civets. And then your mongoose and um, mongoose family and suricat family. Where there's the shrews fall under the order insectivora. Because they, 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 even though they are carnivores, they have been known to take meat. They may, may, only, mostly eat insects. So we'll have a look now what shrews we get here. Shrews. Okay. Oh, I'll just click the names here. We get, oh, where's this guy? Long-tailed, oh, not forestry, that's a bit out of our range. There's a bit high fault. Here we go, this one we definitely get here. The greater dwarf shrew. I'll, I'll show you pictures of them now. I'm just checking which ones. Greater Dwarf Shoe and Swamp Musk Shoe. So number four, which is there. Greater Dwarf Shoe we get here. And, uh, no, sorry, that's the Greater Musk Shoe we get here. And we go, oh, he has another shoe that goes here. Which one is this? Tiny Musk Shoe, which is in the next plate. Reddish grey musk shrew. And what is this one? Grey brown musk shrew. Oh, I, should, I, need to, I need to do some research on my shrews. So we go back to the page. So we don't actually have that bigger variation on, on shrews here. Um, so, so we got number four. Number five, and I mean, and the biggest of these is, um, oh, uh, probably about five or six centimeters, so probably about the same size as that picture, is the biggest true species we get here. And 
that is. We'll see what he eats now. Uh, greater musk shoe. Is a dwarf? There we go. That is greater dwarf shoe. There we go. Insectivorous. Um, almost all of them are insectivores. Insectivorous as well. But um, of a, a lot of these little like shrew families and things like that, they are probably of the least well known. I mean, in terms of reproduction, what they eat, uh, they lead very, very, very solitary uh, or secretive rather than solitary lives. Um, and people have been studying them for years. But it's very difficult to sort of study a shrew in its natural behavior, natural environment without catching it. So a lot of what we do know about your smaller rodents and that is from actually catching them. So guys, I'm going to take a quick stroll just to check for tracks around this water. Make sure we didn't miss him. Well, if we do get the tracks, then we know he's moved on and we can check around again. We've got no tracks here, so I think we're going to head back on the road um, to where we found the last tracks. Maybe just look a little bit more carefully there. Um, maybe we missed tracks and he, he went a different direction. As always, going up into those little drainage lines around these dry patches of water at this time of the year, it's not the leopard or the lion you're tracking you worry about. It's a grumpy old buffalo lying around the corner. But fortunately today there were none of those. No problem, Donna. It's always a pleasure. And then um, 
what he says he's done a little bit of research there are 14 shrew species in South Africa um, without the elephant shrews um, and I think they're probably I think from what we looked at there were, there were three or four that occur in in this area or can possibly occur in this area but without setting a rodent trap it's quite difficult to to find out which ones exactly and when I say a rodent trap, I'm not talking about a mouse trap that will kill them. Um, there's, there's various different ways of catching rodents for research. Um, with uh, most of your rodents, your gerbils and things like that, they have a, a great fondness for peanut butter, believe it or not. So what you do is you, you find a patch where there's some nice soft sand, and you dig a hole, and you bury a bucket. So just the lip is sort of flush with the surface and then you put a, a ring of peanut butter just far enough that they can't sort of hold on with their back feet and lean in to get at it so when they do that they fall in and then they can't climb out of the smooth um, the smooth uh, sides of the bucket but one of the problems with that and then I know people who do do that type of research will literally check it every 20 minutes at night because um, Little, pred little predators like Janet's and that learn very quickly that there's lots of uh, free meals uh, inside these uh, rodent traps. So it's quite uh, it's quite important that those researchers manage to check those traps very uh, those traps very frequently, um, so that uh, their, their research species doesn't get eaten by another little carnivore. I uh, couldn't hear what's going on. Hey guys, um, Remy and I are going to keep um, trying around this area. Um, but in the meantime, we're going we're gonna to cross over, across the sky. We're also going to say uh, goodbye. Um, so from Romeo and myself, thanks very much for joining us. We had a great time. We're going to keep sneaking around this area for a little bit longer to see if we can find that leopard for this afternoon or if we find it quickly, uh, maybe for, uh, for this morning, for a short one. But um, we're going to cross across the Scots and, and I just want to say thanks very much to Nixon FC. She's doing a sterling job. And to all of you out there, where, whatever time it might be in the world, have a great day. This is a male batelier soaring above us and you can tell that because half of the underneath of his wing is black and half white. The female will be predominantly white. So a good way to remember that is a lady getting married in a white wedding dress and a man in a suit. So she'll be predominantly white whereas he's kind of 50-50. And now that the Batalier is sort out of view, the VM can take you across to the next interesting animals that we actually stopped initially to view before the Batalier's came onto the scene. And so happy to see the troop of baboons. It's the first time that I'm actually sharing them with you on film. I've seen them very seldomly since I've been here. And good to have them back around. They came onto the property kind of early Feb and they disappeared for a week or two and look at how comfortable they are clambering along. I'm not sure what they're feeding on. It is a marula tree but as you can see there's not much in it and it could be that they are feeding on insects. This is a dead marula tree and it was killed by elephants. Evidently it was not pushed over, but if VM just pans down slightly, you'll notice at the bottom of the tree it has been ring barked, so all of the bark has been removed, therefore cutting off the transport system from the roots up to the rest of the plants, and this will kill a tree, even if it's a very thin strip around the circumference of a tree. 
if that bark layer is removed, the tree will die. So it could be that they are feeding on insects, I'm guessing, that are now taking advantage of this tree. And they are omnivorous, the baboons, so not strictly vegetarians, and they will even catch and kill small antelope and birds, as well as other small prey items. I'm just going to creep forward a little bit because there's also some other animals here that I'd love to show you. Not just the baboons. Now, you'll notice some kudu with a beautiful big male following closely behind and it is getting to that time of the year where the antelope will start mating and this is so that they can give birth in summer after their gestation period throughout the winter. So he's following closely, doesn't seem to have any competition from any other bulls, but I'm sure as the females come closer to being in full season, they'll attract more males. And this guy is potentially here a little bit early. I'm just going to try and loop ahead of them quickly. And while we do that, I just want to recap on that incredible sighting we had with the puff adder. And Really interesting, after all of the excitement, myself and Vim were chatting and trying to discuss and break down why it was potentially moving around. They are predominantly nocturnal snakes, but interestingly enough, with a bit of research, I've also established that they breed in the middle of winter, and judging by the way he was moving around, I'm wondering if he wasn't on the scent trail of a female. Oh could look like they're running up to the baboons playfully. This is going to be an interesting shot. Let me just try and get into position quickly. So yeah, I think potentially that snake was on the trail of a female. But either way, wonderful to see it on the move. Look at this for a shot. Beautiful. The kudu really are running around playfully amongst these baboons. There they go. Look at that, jumping for joy. And I'm just going to creep forward a little bit more to see what those kudu continue to do. <laughs> Here they come. We don't need to go anywhere. Sorry, Vian. And who knows exactly what it is that's induced this excitement, but you can see they are running around playfully and providing us with some... Look at that. <laughs> that is incredible and great work on the camera, Vim, because it's not easy to follow them as they're pranking about like this. The male kudu must be wondering what he's got himself involved in here. Maybe, maybe bitten off more than he can chew. And it is behavior that's fairly common of kudu. They do like to elevate themselves on termite mounds. Look at <laughs> That is incredible. And the individual there was pronking up to the baboons playfully. I am going to continue to try and reposition accordingly to get us into a good spot. Hold on one second. Who 
knows, maybe it's because the kudu feels safe, knowing with all these baboons around, they've got so many eyes and ears that they can rely on to detect any predators, and maybe that's given them the opportunity to let their guard down and play around. Here they come. Now it's the last two that are left on the termite mound that I'm sure are going to follow the rest of the herd shortly. So we're going to have one last shot of them before they disappear into some thicker vegetation. You can probably hear a bird calling in the background and that was a crested barbet that you would have heard. Is my impersonation to give you an idea of which frequency I was tuning into there. I'm surprised that these two haven't followed the herd more closely, but we'll keep an eye on them. As I'm sure at some stage they are going to run down from that termite mound and jump across the road. But if they do, VM is ready for action. In the meantime, from myself, thanks so much for joining us this morning. It's been a morning with some of the smaller critters, not uh, too much of the big game, or, although having said that, Brent did have a great sighting with the elephants to start off with. So, one of those mornings with no predators, really, and that's fine because we've been blessed with some other great sightings, just the brief sighting of the baboon and these kudu have been really interesting as well as the batalua soaring above us. So hopefully you all enjoyed it as much as we did. Of course the snake, how could I have forgotten about the puff adder, which was a highlight for me and possibly the best snake sighting or definitely the best snake sighting that I've been able to share with you. So I hope you enjoyed that and well done to VM on camera and Nikki and Final Control. And we will see you all this afternoon for the next adventure. So we will stay live a little bit over broadcast just to keep an eye on these kudu. I'm sure it won't take long before they decide to head off and follow the rest of the herd.